near natives um, in terms of eco regions, we have some really great opportunities here. You can see we're kind of where a lot of different eco regions kind of come together. So we're ideally located to reach into you know adjacent eco regions to, to borrow some near native plants. We have the Sonoran Desert farther south. There's different species and species from the Sierra Madre and the Chihuahua Desert from the east. Um, and I'm going to show some more maps in a second, but do you want to say more about near natives? Do I? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I get the whole thing about how people really like plants and then they find something new and it's exciting. It's exciting to, especially if you've been into plants for a while and you're like, um, you know, you need another species of a genus you know or something. It can be, especially people who are getting into plants. Um, uh, it's fun and exciting, and the whole plant collecting thing, I, I understand that very much. I still, I try not to collect, but I still do. Um, and it's exciting, you know, so if you pick near natives, you can kind of scratch that itch without uh, causing uh, ecological damage. So you can get, you know, a cool, a cool plant from the tropical deciduous forest just here, you know, like not that far away. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we have a lot of plants that are not so good from up north. Uh, and a good example is the, the tropical milkweed, which is a big problem in other places. For us, uh, it's, it's native near Hermosillo, so it's like a near native you know, for us. Um, if you can find a clean one that hasn't been pesticide, you know, grown with pesticides. But. So the Sonoran Desert is a really diverse desert. There's seven different subdivisions, and as you move southward, the tropical influence increases, and also the um, uh, freezing temperatures get more and more limited from those species farther south. So um, Tucson is in a different subdivision than Phoenix, so that's kind of important to know. And um, yeah, so I have to say about that. Mm -hmm talk about Sonoran Desert all night, because all the best plants in the universe come from the Sonoran Desert, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess the Sonoran Desert's also the wettest desert in the world, so when you're talking about deserts, a lot of people just think like sand, nothing. That's why we're so diverse, is we get, we get great monsoons, but we can also get really great winter rains, too. And then another great near native eco region to draw from is the Chihuahuan Desert, which is huge and also pretty interesting. Um, what I love about Chihuahuan plants is that uh, the Chihuahuan Desert is a colder, win colder winter desert. So if you are in a location where um, freezing temperatures are, are getting your plants, you might want to think about some from the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, they also have really hot summers there like we do. So, you know, generally those plants can take the heat and the freeze. So it's a really interesting group of plants to work with. Leucophyllum, the uh, Texas Ranger, is one of the plants that you can actually um, get, get off of irrigation, which is some of our native plants can't even get off of irrigation very easily. So, uh, so it's some of those Chihuahuan plants are really drought tolerant. Yeah, awesome. And so here's kind of a typical Chihuahuan desert scene with lots of shrubs and succulents and cacti and a lot of things that look familiar and a lot of things that are familiar and repeat in the Sonoran Desert as well, like creosote, some agaves and yakas. They got great yakas. Yeah. I love this quote from Doug Tallamy. If you guys don't read Doug Tallamy, you do. <laughs> um, so because life is fueled by the energy captured from the sun by plants, it will be the plants that we use in our gardens that determine what nature will be like 10, 20, and 50 years from now. And I just think that's really powerful. The choices that we're making in our little garden spaces, actually, there's a lot of power and a lot of responsibility in that because it is going to carry off into the future. So I think it, it we're all, I don't know, have a responsibility, I think, to, to take that seriously. Oh yeah, lots of species. Use as many as you can. Mm -hmm. 
it's more fun that's that right. way. Yeah, more fun that way. <laughs> Ditch design. Forget, forget about design. Hey, you can do a couple more on that. So when you, and when you get your plants locally from <clears throat> local growers, um, you can ask them about how those plants were grown. And you can ask them if, what their integrated pest management is like. And Please if ask. they use any kind of pesticide, they should be able to tell you about that, how, where, when, and why. Um, also, really great to support the local economy. And uh, of course, you can always grow your own. And then you don't have to ask somebody what you did to make this plant, because you know what you did. So I love the you know trading. Of, of plants between neighbors and friends is really a great way to source clean plants. Sometimes it can be tricky because people aren't exactly honest. Um, they'll say, oh, we never spray our milkweeds, but they spray in the same greenhouse as they have the milkweeds. And so uh, if you spray in that greenhouse, pretty much everything in there is going to get Or they use neem oil. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Neem oil, which could go systemic in your milkweeds. So please don't do that. And definitely put pressure on your grower to keep the plants clean. That's. Yeah. That's kind of, if, if you're not asking for it, they're not going to do it. Yeah. And they're responding to pressure. A lot of these nurseries, uh, the reason they start spraying um, things is people freak out about aphids. So demand to see aphids on your plants. <laughs> and if you do want to support the local growing economy, we live in a great place for that because we have so many talented native plant growers in southern Arizona. Just a cast of amazing people doing really good work from you know desert survivors on the west side to borderlands down in patagonia if you haven't visited them you ought to jared and katie my dear friend steve plath is growing beautiful plants over in safford and bernie is uh, providing lots of wholesale native plants to lots of places throughout and also at a lot of the plant sales uh, Tono Chul isn't here, but they should be on this list too. They grow a lot of really great plants in their yeah. greenhouse that are clean. So, um, I wanted to particularly talk about cactus and succulents too, because cactus and succulent um, nurseries do tend to use quite a lot of chemicals. Um, and so, a couple of things. One, you want to talk to your cactus growers about what they're doing. And always, if you're going to buy cactus, Buy from reputable sources. Please don't buy from Facebook Marketplace. There's such a big problem with poaching. Um, and understand that many of these species are very slow growing. And when you see a huge, beautiful specimen, it took somebody years to grow that if they did indeed grow it from seed or from a small cutting. And that's why they're so expensive. So um, just on, on that note, because yeah, so. you were talking about people growing stuff for themselves, which is great. Don't grab plants from the uh, wild. Yes, no prop, prop lifting. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> don't dig plants up. It, it is not going to live anyway, for the most part. Relocating like, plants yeah. not. That's another thing we got to do all the time, is try to get people to stop moving plants. Because they're like, they'll plant something, like, I don't think it's happy there, and they dig it up and move it, and it's like, that's a setback. And if the plant can handle it, and a lot of plants won't survive that, uh, especially wild plants, because when that seed hits the ground in nature, the roots go really wide, and so if you're trying to dig up the plant um, and make it live, uh, most likely it's not going to for two reasons. One, the roots are too wide, and two, we live in the subtropics, which means that our plants don't go dormant like up north, where they can dig up plants and bare root them, and most of those plants can handle that kind of treatment. Our plants really don't like it. Um, there are exceptions, but you shouldn't dig up wild plants anyway, um, and try not to move your plants all over your yard. <laughs> Just pick a spot and stick with it. And that's another testament for seed grown things too. Not only are you getting better diversity, but you're also, when you're buying, say, uh, you know, harvested ocotillos, root, you know, root bear ocotillos, they say, oh, it's a 50-50 chance it'll live. It's like, it's more like 90% chance it'll live. 90% chance it won't live. Won't live, won't live. sorry. <laughs> it will die. <laughs> and they're very fast from seed. You can get at least a foot a year if you water them all in the summer. You can get so much good growth on them. Nothing's cuter than a bocatillo that's this big. So. Oh, it's yeah. so cute. <laughs> the wildflowers I just got and watching them grow, full of poppies. You can see <laughs> the growth each year. It's just, yeah. it's very cool to watch. Um, 
I do want to give a shout out to Cactus and Succulent Societies, particularly our Tucson group is amazing, salvaging cacti ahead of um, development projects, and that is a great, great way to get they sell them right away, too. Yeah. They, they don't let those things sit yeah. around. So the, the Ocotillos that do get harvested by them get sold more quickly, and there's a bigger chance that those will survive. And they're, and they're, also supporting and they're from them. our region. Yeah. They're not Ocotillos from far away that are less likely to do well here. So. Yeah. And you're also supporting a non-broker? All right. So now we're actually going to talk about some plants. And there's way too many to talk about, and we'll probably have to skip the last half of this, but we're going to try. <laughs> um, and the only way I can think about how to slice and dice this, um, you know, we're kind of all obsessed with pollinators, particularly insect pollinators. And I thought about, well, let's talk about some plant families that if you, if you just really think about native plants from these plant families, including but not limited to some of the examples we'll show you, then you can know broadly that you're doing good things for, for insect fauna in your gardens. So uh, the first family is, oh, it might be, no, it's not my favorite, but it's in my top five. <laughs> Acanthaceae, the acanth family. We did a whole class on this plant, known this group. So great. Tubular flowers, what I love about them, and I think I, I keyed in on this because of, of things that I've learned from you guys, just I mean, obviously they're hummingbird flowers, but many of them are also larval food plants for a just huge diversity of moths and butterflies. So we're going to do, wait, how did I do this? What's in the next slide? Okay, so we're going to do like a, a, a slide on the family, and then we'll show you some examples. And before we get into too much, I want to give you a, a tour of how I've set up these slides, because there's a lot of information on them. A common name and of course the Latin name which is what you really need some details some photos reminder icons of who it supports and then a bloom calendar so flower color and the months you might expect it to bloom in so just look at all of that <laughs> you guys want to talk about this one um, great hummingbird plant when it blooms just completely covered in bright red flowers. Um, it's also a very prolific reseeder, so yeah. you'll get volunteers around your yard, which is awesome. Buy um, one, get six free. Exactly. <laughs> or more. Or more. <laughs> um, anything? Uh, briefly deciduous, but when it goes dormant, it turns purplish first, which is really pretty. Um, also, dormant plants are pretty too, so. Uh, like your shirt says, rethink pretty. Um, and, uh, uh, well, most, this is probably true about most of the acanths, but uh, the checker spots use this as a larval host that I can remember off of. So there's others, but the, I know the checker spots use this. And this is one from the Chihuahuan Desert, so this is a near native. Um, also, when I have a lot of clients who I've put this in their yards, and when it goes deciduous, you know, a lot of shrubs, we, we do a rejuvenation prune and we take it down so it regrows. Don't do that with this one. It's just deciduous. It's, mm -hmm. All the leaves are going to come back on those dead branches, so you don't need to do that with this one. Here's, here's, this is the native Anisacanthus. This yeah. is Anisacanthus thurberi. So the one before, Quadrophytus, is kind of squatty and fat. Um, this one is more tall and slender, more vase-shaped, um, has kind of two bloom periods throughout the year, beautiful white stems. Um, usually a cool orange color, not a very common orange color, but you can also get brick reds, you can find yellow, like there's just diversities in the bloom color, but mostly sort of the sun, sunset orange. Super drought tolerant. So yeah. drought tolerant. Yeah. Once yeah. established. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Loves hot spots too. Yeah. So yeah, Arizona fold wing Diclyptera rusucanata. This is a really great one for shady spots. Um, filtered shade under a mesquite tree or a Palo Verde. Uh, this one will reseed itself all over the place too, and it's got purple flowers. Takes a break in the summer, but. Looks um, like it attracts me. See, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's a hardy, uh, 
hard to find plants that thrive in the shade. So any plant that you can find that thrives in the shade, you should thrives nab it. Thrives and blooms too. And yes. blooms. Okay. Chuparosa. We all know about chuparosae, probably. <laughs> Um, this is one that is so deceiving when you get it in the nursery because it looks like it's just such a, a frail little thing. And if you get a one gallon, it's tempting to like put it somewhere and then crowd around it, but they can get gigantic. So I urge you to um, give, it, give it some space so that you don't have to hack it into weird shapes. Um, super drought tolerant, good for the blazing hot part of your yard. Yeah, this is actually one that uh, sort of helps shape the migration of hummingbirds, too. So very important um, as far as pollinators. When we, uh, I, I, my memory of this plant is always out in organ pipe where it grows. And That's you, the parking lot at the visitor <laughs> center. <side. laughs> and you, you hear the plant before you see it because you can hear the little hummingbirds fighting over uh -huh. it. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the right. plant with no good common name, but uh, uh, Justicia candicans. It's a, sort of a willowy subshrub, uh, or it's a shrub, but it's just kind of this uh, small little plant. Um, it will bloom. Um, yeah, every, it doesn't. Yeah, this is wrong. <laughs> In my yard, every month of the year. Yeah, especially can, winter. Yeah. Right? Yeah, December, January, February, that period where nothing's blooming, this is blooming. And uh, as uh, I think I picked this up from you, but you know, hummingbirds are like a muscle car, but with a one gallon tank. Was that you who said that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, I always think about them in the wintertime because there's not a lot of them, a lot for them to eat. So, um, anything that blooms during that time is a, something you should pick up, and that's the way it does. And that one's great too for smaller spaces because it does stay fairly yeah, compact. Kinda, yeah. Like those little strips between like a sidewalk and a wall or something. This is the perfect plant for that as long as there's irrigation. Yeah. Not as drought tolerant as some of the others. <coughs> oh. <that's fun. laughs> you guys seeing this one around a lot right now? Yeah. So where 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 people have planted it? It does amazing. It's another buy one, get six free plants. Mm. So if you can find it, get one. It will spread all around. It's so pretty. Yeah. And it's just, it's kind of a weak, kind of smaller perennial plant. A little bit of ground cover. Yeah, sometimes when it's been cut back a lot, it does get kind of bushy. Like the ones at the Sonora Desert Museum, mm -hmm. Arizona Sonora Desert Museum are actually, they're, they're long established plants. But, um, Something that I'm remembering too about this whole family, that this plant in particular, uh, it just always reminds me of this family is it violently dehesses the seed, which means it spits them out. I've, I've watered this plant before and, and felt the little seeds hitting my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could and I, I love the, um, the nectar guides on a lot of the acanth flowers are really beautiful. Mexican honeysuckle, another justicia. This one we're borrowing from a little farther south in Mexico. Another great shade plant, although it's super versatile. Like this is like a problem solver plant for me um, because you can grow it in almost any spot in any yard in Tucson. If you have irrigation in the full sun, it does great. Um, you can use a lot less water if it's growing in the shade. There's you know some trade off with how much it'll bloom, but really great plant super tough and yeah no yeah. another, another spitter <laughs> this one yeah it totally like new to flora if you buy plants from us this is going to probably come up in <laughs> this volunteers everywhere yeah it comes up in um, everywhere in our yeah that's the other cool thing when you're buying from local folks who are growing organically like a lot of times you'll buy one plant and you'll get a few more for free in that pot, <laughs> and they're usually not terrible weeds. So um, yeah. that's always good. Sometimes they're rare. Sometimes they're rare. <laughs> uh, we, we recycle our soil, so like we're growing something from seed, and then it doesn't germinate. Um, and we recycle that soil, and we'll pot something up into a five gallon, and then uh, we were selling some uh, uh, scrub oaks not Very long ago cool. with a very cool chitropa coming up underneath it and, and also uh, 
uh, was the Mirabilis. Yeah, the Mirabilis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. This, this really is cool because it looks a lot like the Bretonia, the big shrubby one that is commonly used in Tucson gardens. Um, this one is actually native to the Tucson Basin and is more of a ground cover, so it's a kind of a weak perennial and spreads all over. It's super awesome. Lizards eat the flowers. Tortoise, great tortoise food. Oh, yeah. tortoise food. Actually, I need a tortoise yeah. icon. The whole family so is a good, yeah, all they of can't the base ones. Yeah. Tortoises, but especially the, the flowers. They love this one, though. Um, this one also goes dormant in the winter, so it'll completely die down and uh, don't think it's dead. It'll come back. Yeah, with friends. <laughs> <laughs> This is another Ruelia. This one's from Baja, as the name implies, and it's more of a shrub. It has white, uh, white stems and does go deciduous with our cold wholesome. Super tough. Like I've seen these used in parking lots that are definitely not irrigated. Um, it obviously looks better with a little supplemental irrigation when it's established, but they are they love hot spots, they're drought tolerant, they bloom beautifully. They don't always go dormant, too. I think on your side of town, they do, because um, you live in the Arctic East of <laughs> But, uh, like, in the nursery, and nursery plants are more susceptible to cold than plants in the ground, uh, because they're in a container, they're real exposed, but our rubellias didn't drop leaves. I mean, they dropped some of them, but they weren't, they weren't completely dormant. I thought mine were dead, but they're not. <laughs> They're back. <laughs> All right, we're switching families. Is this your favorite one? No. Oh, no, this it's is not one. actually. Well, you should talk about it though. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, milkweed family, monarchs and queens. Yeah. Monarchs are the gateway drug to butterflies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start we with like monarchs, monarchs and get broad. We want you to love moths. Uh, the tussock uh, moth is mm -hmm. is also. It's a really pretty moth. It also uses milkweed. And there's 30 species native to Arizona, so yeah. really amazing diversity and native milkweeds. And that expands a little bit in New Mexico and California too. So like we have 30 species, and then you have our near natives. So many, really so many milkweeds. Yeah. This I think is one of my favorite native milkweeds. It's a smaller one. Grows sort of up to about two feet tops, um, but again, reseeds very prolifically, you get volunteers everywhere, seems to be, um, out of some of the other natives, it gets utilized a lot as a larval host, um, so caterpillars eating it, um, and please let them eat it. <laughs> and they will mow it down. They will, yeah. to the ground, it will come back. Oh, it, and it, it comes come right, back. it's kind of like they evolve together or something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I like this one. I'll take, I'll take this. Uh, pine leaf milkweed is, uh, uh, you find it in very rocky places, sometimes growing out of pure rock, uh, lots of cracked rock crevices. As a consequence, this species likes good drainage, and I think that's the only limitation on this one. So if you have super clay soil, toss some gravel into your uh, soil, and yeah, I said rock, put rock into your soil. Good for all plants, actually. Terrible top dressing. But, um, and I know everyone in Arizona uses rock as top dressing, but it, it creates reflective heat. But if you work it into the soil, um, it really uh, puts a lot of air into it, holds space for air. And we don't talk about it enough in horticulture, but plants need oxygen in their roots. And so some need it more than others, like this one, but all plants enjoy it. So uh, use your, uh, take that horrible rock uh, cover and work it into the soil and put wood chips in it instead. Um, this one, uh, some people say will say that monarchs don't like it, um, but they do, and we've seen them defoliated completely. Uh, some people say there's a chemical in there that it's a little too strong for them. Uh, I have not found this to be true, and uh, the reason that monarchs will favor a certain species um, at certain times is because of where they come from, because monarchs. Their, pa their, their pattern is like an hourglass. So they're coming from all over in the north and then they funnel through the southwest and then they fan out in Mexico again. So they're going back and forth and what they were eating before might, will determine what they might prefer when they get here. And we have such a diversity of milkweeds. 
um, that you know that will you, you will see uh, monarchs uh, preferring different species, except with the one that we were talking about before, the uh, Arizona milkweed is always preferred for some reason. They it's always like that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll grab this one. Yeah. This is rush milkweed. Some people call it desert milkweed, but there's several species called desert milkweed too. Asclepia subulata. This is um, at the Fry, my neighborhood Fry's parking lot. I was so excited about it because mm -hmm. I went to take pictures of this beautiful, fully blooming plant or a group of plants, and there were caterpillars, there were adult butterflies. It was awesome. I'm like, this is what we need to be doing, right? Um, and then, at the next slide, we can see oh, full sun, good <laughs> drainage, low water, all that stuff. Um, oh, I didn't show it. Ah. Okay. Well, anyway, what happened here is um, a few weeks later. Um, so a landscaping crew had come in and, um, and, and cut them <laughs> to rejuvenate them, but left some stick. It just looks terrible. Um, and I've followed these plants because this is the grocery store I go to most often. And the plants are mostly dead. There's a couple that are kind of alive. And it just really ruined, uh, through terrible maintenance, ruined what could be like a really amazing urban, um, you know, contributor to, to Mar. Uh, um, populations, but sadly, not so. Um, so yeah, aphids. Yes. You want them on your milkweeds when you buy them <laughs> because yes. it proves that the plant does not have systemic insecticides in it because aphids are chewing, sucking insects. Guess what caterpillars are? Chewing, sucking, biting insects. So whatever kills aphids will kill monarchs and queens and everything else. Even, so. if, even if you use an organic method for getting rid of them, what happens when you, when you clean all that out is you're also cleaning out the ladybug larva, green lacewing larva, hoverfly, Possibly um, butterfly eggs butterf and and newly hatched butterflies and so and guess who comes back right away? The aphids. aphids. So actually, treating aphids only makes more aphids because you you decrease the uh, insects that are eating them, and they take a longer time to cycle through and, and repopulate. These guys populate like crazy. So I think so. I could go on about this for another. <laughs> yeah. um, and even just hosing them off. You could be hosing off monarch eggs. Yeah. Even squishing them with your fingers. Just, you know, they kind of offend our sense of, like, order or whatever, beauty or whatever in our guides. But we need to get over it. They're fine. And They're pretty. Everything it's, comes in to take care of it anyway. It's this tiny little ecosystem. And you could, like, sit and watch it all day. Yeah, spider. Like, yeah, and you'll see, <laughs> you'll see ants licking aphids because they're licking the sugars off of them. You'll see horrible little ladybug larvae that are so weird looking and cool like mm -hmm. and what's the larva that carries the carcasses on its back that's the uh, that's the green lacewing larva yeah oh, there's some yeah. beautiful bugs but when they're larvae they're so creepy and they're cool. so metal <laughs> they're so <laughs> tough yeah so you don't use insecticidal soap on their absolutely nursery. not you don't use okay no. we actually don't treat insects in our nursery okay and if if we ever do have a problem uh which I don't know if we ever really have had a breakout an outbreak like that, but um, if we did, I would just say, "Oh, there was a failure," yep. and let it go. And we can't let things go like that's what we get so into. It's like we gotta solve this problem, and and you're not solving problems; you're making problems. <laughs> and we most of the damage that happens to plants, we do do our because we're over managing. Um, so. This is it's they've evolved together for. You know, no. time, whatever. You never see. <laughs> it's like this is just this is what they do. Yeah. You never works. see milkweeds in nature without aphids. They, they always have aphids. Every species. Oh, we're switching Ooh. families. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're coming into the sunflowers here. I think this is my favorite. Asteraceae, and broadly speaking, just make sure you have lots of sunflowers, native or otherwise. Definitely lots of natives, but there's a lot of great sunflowers that. Will do all kinds of good things. They're um, generally long bloomers and uh, provide abundant nectar. Um, and they serve bees, flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds. So powerhouses, really. And finches. And, and finches. They love yep. the seeds. 
daisy daisy shaped flowers. So let's talk about some. And I picked out some some familiar species and some that are a little maybe maybe on the fringe. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to talk about this one? Yeah, I love this plant. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a plant that changes its look a lot. It, it doesn't like to have the same haircut for too long. When it, when it first grows, it'll be sort of tight and on the ground, and it spreads by these rhizomes, and um, and so it'll colonize a little area, and then when they bloom, they sort of pop up and and uh, look completely different. Um, and then every once in a while you cut them back when they go when they get kind of doggy looking and ugly and that's a meddling that's okay with a lot of plants and there is a natural precedent for it too because in nature a lot of these plants that we tend to that do well with us cutting back in the garden um, are cut back in nature but it's not a person doing it it's a, a deer or something so um, the other thing that's cool about this plant that I read not long ago is that birds use this for their nesting um, particularly, and it seems to have a lot, of, it keeps out microbes that are bad for them, or I think it, 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 there's some problem that they have that if this uh, if mugwort's in their nesting material that it keeps their nest cleaner, so. Yeah, I know the herbalists are really excited about this plant, right? Oh, it yeah. does something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a medicinal plant. Don't native bees sometimes use it in yeah. their egg? Uh, they, they nest near it. They, they nest under and near the whole genus Artemisia. It smells wonderful too. Yeah. Yeah. Put it near your walkway where you walk, where people walk by, and they're like, "What's that smell?" And it's yeah. a nice soft plant near your walkway too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and marble, it's a marble food. food. So for so <laughs> many cool things. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, oh, look at this room. one. That's a room. Oh. I know yeah. we all love that one. It is native. <laughs> it's not invasive if it's native. <laughs> So <laughs> it is native to our, our washes and riparian ecosystems. It is a disturbance plant. You know, it, it gets, um, lives in areas where there's floods and all kinds of things. And so full sun, sandy soil, um, you know, there may be areas where you don't want it in your yard, but if it's just, you don't have to declare war on this plant when it's just growing um, and you know not causing problems with your irrigation or whatever and the reason to do that is on the next slide um, this is kind of it's hard to see but kind of an amalgamation I stole these photos from Marguerite Rimmerman um, these were all taken um, in one day on one plant um, this is an incredible powerhouse pollinator supporter plant. So, oh, look, it's the, the, um, yeah, purple oh, the hair streak. Streak. yeah, that's one of the most beautiful butterflies. It is. So, you know, there's a place for this. Definitely. Yeah. What's next? Desert marigold. Oh, desert marigold. These are everywhere right now. Aren't they happy? <laughs> <laughs> and every time you really take a close look at. Well, when I take a close look at the ones in my yard, I have a kind of a nice patch. There's always, always different insects using them. Um, so I think they're awesome. A lot of the daisy family, and this is one of them, um, have plants that, uh, I have a book this fat on the solitary bees, so which is most bees. We live in an area that has the most, um, I think we battle it out with, a, there's a place in India but between us and India, uh, the most bee species in the world. And I'm not talking about honeybees, we're talking about everybody else, um, and especially mostly solitary bees. And a lot of them are very, they, they use very specific nectar and they won't wake up if there's if their plants are not there, they know. They somehow, I guess, have sensed that the rains have been sufficient and sufficiently timed uh, for their plant. And they will, these bees will actually uh, they're, you know, they live in underground as a larva and they develop into a little bee and then if it's time to go but the plant's not there, they will go into a, a sort of a sleep state and sleep a whole year more or two and to wait for their plant to come out. And so that's pretty marvelous. Um, it also makes me think about how important it is to, when we talk about planting diversity and getting those plants out there, that's one reason there's entire species that are dependent on one's plant. And there's several bee species that this is the one they use. So, this is a great um, gateway to native plants 
um, <laughs> plant as well because you can, if you find seed from it, it's very easy to get established from seed. You can buy a container plant, it will reseed itself. Um, it's tough, it's easy, it should be in every single yard mm -hmm. in Tucson. Oh. There you go. Oh, food, finch food too. Yeah. yeah. Thistles, speaking of finches, um, yeah. we have a whole lot of native thistles that are awesome, like this New Mexico thistle. I think there might be a couple of thingy things there. Um, seeds for birds, like an, another thing, like when you come upon a, a thistle patch, you know, there, and if it's in full bloom, like it's pulsating, it's vibrating with insect life. And then once it goes to seed, it's, you know, providing seeds for birds again. So really super great. Not right for every yard in a, any HOA necessarily, but, um, <laughs> you know, if you have a wilder patch, I'm so excited because I finally have this coming up in my yard. Um, I put seeds out for several years and I finally have it. I'm so excited. Great for bumblebees. Yes. Yeah, bumblebees. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I had the other one coming up too. Yeah. Mist flowers are very important. These should go hand in hand with milkweeds. These are um, utilized by monarchs and queens and other butterflies. Is it the monarch specifically that uses? I think the queens do too. So there's an alkaloid in the nectar of flowers like this that. Um, the butterflies actually use to attract mates, and then in mating, will pass it. The male will pass it to the female, and then what she uses it as to protection on her egg. She coats your eggs in the alkaloid, which mm -hmm. makes them less edible to pests. <laughs> so, and it's I mean they're beautiful too, and it's another one where when they're blooming, they're covered, covered in insects. I always tell people when we when our plants are blooming, and in this one in particular. Um, to walk by it during blooming season, you're like, <laughs> yeah. so, so many butterflies. <laughs> Get a butterfly. I like this one because it's a tall, a taller shrubby um, mist flower, and you can pair it with this other one we're going to look at, which is the Greg's Blue Mist. It's a few months down. That's a shorter one, and they bloom at different times. So if you use them both, you can um, extend your your bloom period. And I always plant those with Arizona milkweed, yeah. always, because they need the same sort of uh, moisture regime and they just work really well together. S side mm -hmm. note on that plant, uh, sometimes people, when you, look, when you look stuff up on the internet, always look for local sources of information because what's true for one area is not gonna be true for another. And that's a good example, that plant is uh, invasive in a lot of places. Um, not here, it's in near native here, so it's uh, not an invasive species here, but in, in Australia or somewhere like that, it's, it's a bad This thing. one? Yeah, that, that one is huh. invasive in, in some areas. And so um, when you see that information, people will say, I've read online it's invasive. Like, yeah, in Australia. <laughs> like, um, I mean, it's from our native yeah. cactus, uh, Aplentia anglomanii, our native cactus is invasive in Australia. Like, but people will just read it that it's invasive and they're not thinking locally. So always, always think locally and get your information from local sources. Even if you're online and you're searching something, type plus Arizona. You just do that and you'll save yourself so much trouble. Oh, I love this one, spreading flea bane. Um, if you don't have it in your yard, just get one little core of it from these guys and then you'll always have it. Um, it's sweet, sweet, sweet and attracts a real big diversity of smaller insects and once you have one you'll have it all over forever um, it blooms all the time spreads all over it's just a great low maintenance this is like I, there's a group of plants that I call crock pot plants like you throw <laughs> your food in the crock pot in the morning and you go to work you come mm -hmm. home you have dinner like this one you just you put it in the ground give it what it needs and just forget all about it and it does what it needs to do Um, you guys want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I love this plant. Uh, really great fall bloomer. Uh, smells really cool. Um, unfair name, turpentine bush. I don't know if it's turpentine. We should quite... name that one. Yeah. <laughs> it just smells herby and amazing. Um, and very tough plant. Um, it can grow in some pretty crappy soils. Um, and uh, there's several species of Ericomeria. 
we see them all the time when we're out in the field. Katie and I do a lot of botanizing in the borderlands and we come across either this species or uh, there's one that grows in the uh, Cuneata, I think it is, or Cunera Cuneata, it grows out of the rock crevices and stuff. But man, you always see it blooming from far away because it's just like the whole plant is yellow. And uh, uh, oh, and note on that, yellow plants, are, you're not allergic to them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> If you know us, you know I talk about this all the time, it drives me batty, but people associate the color yellow with their allergies. The things that actually are getting your allergies, and I'm someone who suffers very bad from allergies, are plants that you cannot see. Because wind pollinated plants don't waste energy on petals that will get in the way of the wind. And they don't have bright colored flowers that are attracting pollinators. So um, Palo Verdes, mesquites, like, I hear all the time people like, oh, my allergies. And what's happening is people are suffering, and they look around, and they see this big yellow tree, and like, that's what's getting me. Or they smell citrus, and like, the citrus is getting me. The citrus is attracting bugs, too. Uh, so plants use visual or, um, or scent to attract the pollinators, and so that's not your allergy. Well, and I'm going to follow that up with a little, a little nuance, which is you might get an allergy panel, and it might tell you that you are allergic to Palo Verde. Yeah. However, to actually make that happen, you would have to go to a flower and, and then stick your finger up your nose <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. that to happen, and then you probably would be allergic to it, but that's not yeah. going to happen naturally, Pollen that's unless wind. your nose picker. <laughs> when pollinated plants. plants have a very dusty, almost like, it's almost like mushroom spore, um, that's their pollen is very much like that. And uh, plants that are like this have very sticky, heavy pollen. And um, the reason they talk about pollen so much with allergies anyway is because it's the only thing we can identify when they do air quality checks. So uh, pollen you can see from 10,000 years ago, and they, that's air, Camara lyricifolia. Like they, that's, how, that's how clearly marked pollen is. We know what it is. All that other junk's in the air, they don't know what it is, so they don't talk about it. So they talk about uh, plants all the time as being this allergen, huge allergen uh, problem, but it's overemphasized because they don't know what the other stuff is. Who's next? Ooh, firewheel, or blanket flower, or many other names. Many other names. <laughs> I like this one because it's another, if you buy one, you get a whole bunch. It like will bloom all through the hot season. There's all kinds of crazy cultivars of it, um, but it's native to right here. So this is a good one to like, even though you can get all these crazy cultivars, if you get locally um, sourced plants that were grown from local seed, then you're probably doing better things um, ecologically, but. Yeah, when you, when they select for flower colors in the nurseries or select for whatever other things. Double blooms. Double blooms. <laughs> <laughs> Usually there's, this, there's these unintended uh, consequences and a good famous thing that many of you might know about is how the newer roses don't smell good anymore. And uh, they're now getting back to trying to breed the scent back into roses, but um, it has these unintended consequences when we, when we over select plants and try to like Know, thirst after like this brightest flower, or the you know it's the reddest red, the reddest red, or <laughs> everyone wants the opposite color. Of what it drives me crazy. There are so many species of bird of paradise, and they're all yellow except the orange and red one. And yet there's a yellow selection of it. It's just like all no, the other species are yellow, but we're going to sell this yellow one. It's so weird. Uh, I don't know if you can see this bee butt here covered in pollen. It's super cute. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Bee butts. Who's next? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a weird one. This is a patchy plant, Guardiola platyphylla. Like, you have to look at it for a few minutes to realize that it's actually in the aster family because it doesn't um, look like a typical aster. Little white flowers. This one I, I met in um, Madera Canyon, giant plants of it. And I was like, what is that thing? Because it was literally vibrating with insect life. Um, it's a little harder to find. These guys have it sometimes. Yeah. Blooming right now in my yard. It's a basal aster, which means that it, 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 it and when it, all these plants were evolving, it, it was one of the, it's in that branch of the first plants that started to produce those composite flowers. So basal asters always have a cluster of flowers, but not as many as our modern, modern uh, asters have. 
So time check, we're at an hour, just so you guys know. <laughs> well, we have a lot more plans to talk about. way through the slide. Yeah, so <laughs> we've got another hour. Oh, just warning, so. if you need to get up and leave. Lay right? through. Just throw some at And we'll try to, like, pick it up a little bit. <laughs> so fun. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Legacia. This one's very cool. It's so cool. You guys talk about this one. Uh, <laughs> we see this the most in the Atascosa Mountains. Um, it's everywhere. I mean, it's all along the borderlands, but we, we spent a lot of time in the Atascosas, which is just to the west of Nogales on the border. And it's grown out of super rocky soils. It likes really good drainage. It does not like containers very much, which poses a challenge to us. But if we sell them fast enough, which we do, um, then they get in the ground, they're fine. Um, but they, if you get a hold of this, this is way better than Lantana in terms of attracting butterflies. And, it's kind of tall. And mm -hmm. It's tall. It'll, it'll, yeah, and it recedes. That's the most frustrating thing about it because the, uh, the seeds are hard to germinate, but they, they recede themselves all the time. <laughs> um, but uh, super cool. Another good one for um, kind of shady areas. Yeah. I just learned this common name, golden fleece for thymophila, which oh, I also yeah. I learned is disodia. But yeah. yeah. Anyway, this had a great uh, year last year. I was seeing lots of it everywhere. Lots of people asking me what it was. Um, you can get it in container plants. You can seed it in by seeds. Super easy. Like just a super easy, easy way to support native bees and, and other insect pollinators. Like you don't have to do anything. Yeah. This, this one shows up at the places where they sell pansies and petunias for some reason. It's not this species, but it's another one. Oh, um, it's tinnifolia or something. Yeah, like yeah. Um, which is it's is near native as well, but. Um, uh, it has the same benefits, but uh, you know, if it is from Home Depot, it is going to likely be more you know, chemically treated. But. Any plant that crossed state lines to get here, if it was grown in California or grown in another place and had to cross into Arizona, has been treated. Yeah, they have there to. cannot be any bugs on it, and the fastest way to make sure there aren't any bugs on something is treat it. So just know that. You know, your food plants, too. Yeah. OMG, Mexican bush sunflower, <laughs> Tithonia fruticosa, every, every yard in Tucson should have this plant, if you can find it. Can yeah. find I'm it. hoarding it right now. It's no hard to grow. I have a bunch of it. <laughs> it's hard to so grow. It's so hard to grow. Yeah. Why but, is it so hard to grow? Uh, it's another one of those that recedes in your yard, I but, uh, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm suspecting that it's, the, you know, finches are the ones that are spreading it, which means we should probably use acid when we um, treat the seeds. Um, so sometimes, you know, seeds, you can't just always just plant them. Um, many you have to like trick them. So we put them in the fridge or we uh, will treat them with acid, usually like vinegar, um, or if it's a serious plant, we'll use sulfuric acid. But, um, but uh, we, we have to use acid to soften the coat because in nature, uh, either a bird has already done that work or time. I get this seed going through uh, abrasive sand or something after a period of time that it wears that coat off. I think in the case of this, it's birds. But um, when you see it, snap it up because yeah. if someone else will. Is this a big perennial? It's huge. It's like a tree. It's giant. Yeah. Perennial it, though. It is perennial. Yeah, yeah. There, you're, there is an annual one. Um, there is an annual type coming, coming in. Uh, yeah, but no. this one, uh, this will freeze back in a lot of places in town and comes back readily. In fact, it'll grow. It's, it's kind of crazy how fast it grows. Yeah. So I just chopped mine down because they got frozen. Chopped them down. They're already coming back. You want to be careful with this one if you get a container. First of all, it's going to look ugly, ugly, ugly in a container. Just, just go with it. <laughs> um, and if it's small and you're putting it in late in the season, protect it from the cold to help it get through that first winter. You'll never have to do it again because it'll get big quickly and the rest of its foliage will keep it, keep the roots safe over winter. Wait until first week of March, pack it all the way back if it's ugly from winter and it will come right back. Monarchs that come to my yard, come to my yard first because they see this when they're flying high, they come down to nectar and then they find the milkweed. Yeah, and a lot of plants in, a lot of, Plants look dumpy in containers, by the way. <laughs> and part of that is like, uh, think about how big that plant gets. And so you get a little one gallon, and like, 
people will say, this doesn't look good. And it's like, why does this cost $10? <laughs> 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 Which is cheap in this town. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it wants to be big. It wants its roots out here, and they're all just right here in this yeah. sad little pot. It's yeah. hot. It's dry. If we could grow plants not in pots, we would. But it's. it's but you can't dig them up. Yeah, you can't dig them up. So. So here's its cousin, Tithonia rotundifolia. Such a fun one. So great. This you put this in with seeds. This is more of an annual or sometimes a short-lived perennial. I've gotten it to overwinter before. It's just gorgeous. Much smaller flowers and the bright red, but super awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when do you throw the seeds out for that? Because I've, no. I've had great. Now? Yeah, mm -hmm. after frost. After frost. Okay. Yeah, because, yeah. This is another one um, yeah. you can do easily by seed. Grown golden crown beard or cow pen daisy, verbicina encelioides, because it looks like encelia brittle bush. Mm -hmm. Flowers look almost the same, but the plant is shaped really differently. This is an annual, um, but monsoon season, you'll find big patches of it near the Rito and um, other water, water courses. It's just super duper easy plant to get going for pollinators. And it will receive all over the place. Mm -hmm. But this is a more specialty one. You guys want to talk about that? Yeah, Figura Stenoloba, uh, uh, just another awesome Asteraceae. And uh, a good pollinator plant has sort of fine foliage, uh, um, thus the name Stenoloba. Kind of a big round form. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mine's uh, huge. Nice shrub. Yeah, it's a, a, a really easy plant to grow um, as long as it gets its water, blooms almost all the time. Um, and uh, um, what else? Um, I'm trying to think what else. That's it. Let's move on. Yeah, move. Okay. <laughs> Blackfoot daisy. Everyone should have a blackfoot daisy. They're yeah. super sweet, super happy. They smell really great if you get down. They're super low. Oh, I've never so smelled them. You oh, gotta so get in so there. Right? <laughs> you get in there. It's really sweet. Um, they're just so happy looking, and it's a great little ground cover. They're a little fussy for me, but I'm not a real gardener. Um, so, like, in my yard, if I plant three, two will make it, and one will crap out, and I don't understand why. <laughs> so, I always tell my clients, don't feel bad. They do seem well, too. Ooh, legumes, we're switching families. <laughs> and, and life ones. Yeah, so we've got a lot of, of native legume trees that everyone is familiar with. They're all amazing, but let's talk about the velvet mesquite, the mighty, mighty, mighty. Velvet mesquite. Very important. <laughs> probably, probably the most important tree in our region. Uh, I mean, it may be ironwood, like between the two, more palabrity, but those three are the most important trees. Uh, this one has a phenology that's very specific, and if you get a non native one, it will not have the same wildlife. It will not, and the, the beans taste like crap too. But um, the, uh, and, and you have to make sure your nursery knows, and they almost all don't. Um, but uh, the, um, the growers know, or at least the growers that are native uh, plant freaks know that you, you can't collect seed for this plant in town. It will be hybridized. And so um, we, you know, we source our plants from way far away from people uh, so that there's no uh, cross-pollination between the Chilean or the South American mosquitoes. It, um, they, they readily, um, because it's bee pollinated and the bees move, and they really carry that, that pollen from tree to tree. And Show so, me the next slide because it builds on yeah. this. So, the, um, okay, so, <laughs> mesquites love bugs, birds love bugs. People don't like bugs, but they're going to have to get used to it. Because they um, like birds. Generally, yeah. people like birds. There are yeah. so many <laughs> there are so many insects in the mesquite, and they're always doing something. Um, and um, the one thing to re realize is that if you're dealing with native plants, um, and you're in Arizona, most of our insect fauna is native, because we don't live in a place where they've introduced a lot of insects, thank goodness, so far. Um, and what that means is that they have a developed relationship, they won't kill each other. Um, and so um, I see it every day on Tucson Backyard Gardening. Horrors <laughs> killed my tree. Um, no. <laughs> what happened is you over trimmed your tree, the sun scalded the trunk, 
and there's a bunch of dead wood in there and the boars are eating the dead wood because that's what they eat and um, so their trees dying probably because they're not watering it right or the water tables dropped um, or a number of variety of reasons that are not as visual but they see the bug and they blame the bugs and but the so bugs the are right the birds and mistletoe, we don't even same need thing. To talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Just leave it there. We'll yeah. Forever. But the, uh, uh, there's, I'll give you one example. The Lucy's warbler comes here at a specific time because when the velvet mesquite breaks bud, there's all this um, extra floral nectary activity in the, in the canopy. Extra floral means not in the flowers. So um, there's all this like liquid sugary stuff that all these insects are eating, little ants and and just everything. And the Lucy's warbler comes here at that specific time to take advantage of those insects. The Lucy's warbler is having trouble now in the urban areas because the non-native mesquites don't have that tree. So, um, uh, so it's important to plant the native one. And, and this is even true, like the honey mesquite doesn't have the same qualities either. It's not a bad tree to plant, um, but, but it's not still quite the same as the velvet mesquite. Um, and did you put scrooby mesquite in here at all? Yeah. Okay. Look! Oh. Uh, and the scrooby mesquite also uh, has its own value. This one doesn't cross, uh, uh, it, it doesn't hybridize the uh, velvet mesquite. So they're actually now not for sobis. They're not, they're in de new gen right now, but we won't freak you out with that. Um, but uh, <laughs> do you, you want? I mean, oh, I want to say one more thing about scrooby. It's really cute. It's a smaller tree, so if you don't have room for a velvet, it's got the cool, what? I love oh, you love it. Love it. Like, mm -hmm. What are you trying to tell me? I'm obsessed with them. A little yeah, bit yeah. higher water use, but not ridiculous. Worth it. Grows, Small patio tree. Grows straight, it grows straight up. As yeah. opposed to the velvet mesquites, and this is why the nurseries got away from velvet mesquite. Velvet mesquite goes this way first. Um, and a lot, of our, a lot of our trees do because they're trying to protect their trunk from the sun because we live in an open area. Um, but the, uh, um, um, the, the, so, if the, um, the nurseries got away from velvets because they grew too wide and they were inconvenient for nurseries. So, um, and Inter, also... Inter-South American. Yeah, the South right. American mesquites right. kind of grow upright, even though they break in the wind all the time. But uh, they, uh, they were favored for that reason. This tree grows straight up on its own naturally and, um, and has evolved here. So it has a, a daintier trunk, so it doesn't get like beat up by the wind um, in the same way that the... Uh, the bigger mesquites do. Let's do the next one. Kidney wood. Mm -hmm. This one's a little harder to find, but really worth it. Another small legume. This one's thornless. Um, good for real small places. Host for the marine blue butterfly. It's just a sweet, sweet tree. It smells beautiful when it yes. blooms. Yeah, and the foliage. Yeah, yeah. it's just oh, gorgeous. Right. Yeah. Always full of life. This was in my, my driveway at my old house. Isn't that cool? Guys? Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's nice. Okay, so now we're reaching farther south into Mexico for Palo Blanco. Um, very upright, very small footprint as far as how much space it takes up. Okay. Yeah. I know. It's cool <laughs> till, so we wanna we don't want to stop <laughs> but we wanna open it for questions. Okay. Um, for a few minutes. Uh, and maybe five minutes or something. Five minutes for questions and then we'll ah, yes. do the plant swap and so forth. So who has questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, keep I have one that like hundred people have asked. What's that? Are you willing to show your slides? Um, um no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. totally fine. I have a question about the perennial tithonia. Is it full sun? It can take full sun. Uh, with a lot of these plants, m more sun will equal more flowers, but it will also equal more water. Okay. So, However, I hung water mine. I don't have irrigation. Yeah, I don't need that. It's not terribly demanding mm -hmm. once it's okay. established. Yeah. I, I have a question about some of the shrubbery. I have a heck of a time with critters coming. It's to chow everything down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I hate to put wire cages around everything. Uh, any suggestions? Two are, things. Okay. Buy bigger plants. Oh, so instead okay. of one gallons, buy five gallons okay. and consider putting a cage around it for the first year okay. and reuse your cages. Okay. There's a reason that the fuzzy, non-venomous, uh, uh, no 
fangs, you know, a mm -hmm. rabbit, if, if, if they, they live well in the desert, and that's because anything can become food to them. So no matter what anyone tells you, there is no rabbit proof plant. Like, I've seen every plant that people tell me, oh, they don't touch my rosemary. I've seen, seen them mow that down. <laughs> like, there's, yeah, jojoba is a famous one. Like, nothing should be able to eat jojoba. It's so full of tannic acid, but rabbits are not, you know, so. <laughs> Putting out water sometimes if what they want mm -hmm. is moisture. Decoy. Yep. Yeah. Diversion yeah. tactics. Um, take your old garden seed that, that you like, oh, I don't really I'm not gonna plant this anymore, you know, and put it near a little watering hole away from if you have the space, away from that area in a place where there's not a, you know, where you don't mind them being. They would rather be away from you anyway. They don't want to be close to us in our house. So on the edge of your property you have a little watering hole with some you know, uh, seeds coming up, and half the time they're just digging up anyway. Like javelinas don't, even though they destroy plants, they're not actually going after plants half the time. They're they're digging around for grubs or something. So they're just curious little buggers. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question online about golden crown beard. Mm. Is that an invasive no. species here? Absolutely not. One hundred percent native. Verbicina and ciliolus. Oh yeah. Oh. No. That's again. That's a thing of where uh, it, it's a, it can be invasive elsewhere, but it's native for us. Weedy, which is good. African marigold. Is it okay to uh, plant it near your, near your vegetable garden? I wouldn't. You wouldn't. I wouldn't. We have about a million native marigolds, and anything that it has African in the name is from Africa and could get out. Um, yeah, they were asking about African marigolds if you plant them near your vegetable garden. Um, do native marigolds. Yeah, and yeah. The, na the native ones will have more of a positive impact. So mm -hmm. when they tell you to plant stuff in the daisy family close to your garden, it's because a lot of those nectar feeders as larvae eat uh, aphids and stuff like that, like ladybug. And so, um, so the native ones are going to attract way more of that because they evolved here. So they have more of a close relationship with our uh, insects, and so um, so you'll 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 do way better with uh, uh, native uh, plants in the aster family. So, yeah, I have a question about so when you plant a native and, and when trying to get it established, you're gonna have it on irrigation or water. It. So is there a rule of thumb of how long you should leave it on irrigation or how many years, like a couple of years, and then wean it off or? How so, does that work? So native plants don't always, they're not always Sonoran Desert. And, you know, we live, the reason that we have so much diversity in our flora and fauna in Arizona is because of the topography. We live in the Sky Islands region. So there's all this incredible topography and there's places where water collects and there's places where it's super dry. So not all of our native plants will live off of irrigation. Also, um, watering your plants is the only use that we do that goes back to nature because we're sucking this we're, we're stealing water from nature and and hoarding it away in pipes and the only time that it goes back to nature because you're watering your plants that feeds um, insects and birds and the microbes in the soil and you're bringing ecology back by your, in your little yard it's the only use of water that that where that's happening otherwise um, you know most of our water is going to farming and mining and uh, you know the farming is not good for wildlife. And uh, <laughs> if we're going to look at if we're going to look at uh, waste, water waste, let's look at our toilets first. Because yeah. in 2023, we're still flushing our feces down the toilet with water, with precious water, like that. Like if groundwater. We, there's many other uses of water <laughs> we should feel guilty about and start thinking about changing our ways. We shouldn't be growing lettuce in Yuma, but that's a political thing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. She's there's okay. Yeah. Just um, so many cool plants. I know. Questions? We will avert our eyes. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't quite answer your question. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I just I do want people to feel less guilty about watering plants because it, it is the best use of water. Um, now, some plants can go off irrigation and they'll be fine, like creosote bush. I mentioned earlier, lupofilum. The rangers can go off irrigation. And all, many of your succulents can. Um, and eventually, many of our trees will also be, uh, they're not really off of irrigation, your neighbors are watering them, but, um, but a lot of these plants, they, their, their roots reach much farther than we know. So once they get established, um, it, it, it depends on your soil, it depends on how you water, 
So if you are watering, you know, frequently and not very deep, uh, I can't tell you how often people tell me, like, oh, I'm watering every other day uh, for half an hour. One gallon emitter is half a gallon. That's nothing. And so, um, and, and that does a couple of things. One, the roots aren't going to go very deep. Um, two, the salts build up because you're shallow watering and our water is salty and our soil is salty so that where that water stops, there's this, you can see it when you dig up, uh, you'll see this white line, that's, that's salt. So, um, so when you start a plant and you're growing it, you're going to wean it from the everyday schedule to, um, you know, uh, more space in between waterings and deeper watering. Like you've got to get the deeper watering. And so mulching I, helps too. And I'll just piggyback on that. So I talk about finding your magic number. The magic number of minutes that it takes for the water to get to the proper depth for that period or for that type of plant. Right. Do not deviate from that number of minutes. What changes is the interval between waterings. So yeah. You're always watering to the correct depth. Anything yeah. more is wasting water. Anything less is wasting water. Yeah. yeah. Figure out that magic <laughs> that, number. That's the, that's the key, right? <laughs> and in nature, even yeah, saguaros, saguaros don't germinate every year. They germinate on the wet years, and that's true about all of our like wildflower years. Like it doesn't happen every year, right? It happens like years like this where you get a sufficient amount of rain. So um, plant recruitment occurs in nature on the wet years. So mimic that, and then and then wean it away from that. And also know that there. Will be times too where we get super hot summers like in 2020 yeah. where you might have to water a little more because or if you don't mind some things looking really crappy in the summer that's fine too but uh, yeah just knowing that they're gonna look like hell because it is hell out there um, and if you're not gonna supplement water then that's just sort of the price which you know and 2020 could have used a lot more water <laughs> yeah there uh, there a lot of cacti died when the rains came back. And the reason they died is because we had the worst drought in a long time, two years. And so that's two years of, you know, cactus, cacti, when they uh, um, go through drought, one of their techniques of survival is to, to let go of roots. They die, they die, they get root die back. And they can regrow roots just like that. But when you have two years of that, and then you have a lot of rain, those cacti just rotted. And we're talking about in, in the wild, they, Plenty of Anglomania is the most common prickly pear out there, and you saw them like rotting all over the place because of that. So if you love your cacti, just splash them once a month in the summertime, and so you don't have that problem, you know, especially if we get a drought like that. All right, well, thank you so much. This was amazing. For follow these folks on social media. Yes. Because if you enjoy, well, look, oh, well, 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 if you enjoyed the level of knowledge that was dropped here, they do that online too. Yeah. So definitely follow them on social media. And go to their nursery. Yeah. 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 Can you walk all at once? You guys, is it open now? Yeah. Okay. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, so we're just two people, and so people, when they think about us as a nursery, they think like we're other nurseries, and then we have a staff. We don't. It's just the two of us, so we do everything, and that means growing and everything else, the business stuff. So, like, we have the three days where we work really hard with people in person, and um, you can always buy from us online when we're not open. So if you're worried about something going out, you know, like, like selling out, buy it online. We always pick the nicest ones for the people who buy online because um, they deserve it. So, um, so we, we, we select the nicest ones. So don't think like, well, I don't get to pick it. And it's like, we're going to pick it for you. It's going to be way better than, than um, you know, than just coming in the weekend and picking. And sometimes people don't pick the right plants anyway. They're like, oh, that one looks prettiest. And it's like, that means they're blooming a lot. And it's probably going to be tomorrow we'll pick nice for you you guys want to do a raffle don't you yeah so we're going to do the raffle do you need to tie up our line before i um i think we're we're good so okay um i think um we've got like uh, one two three four different raffle prizes here so i think uh you know if i pull your number pick what you want How's that? All right, so this number is 